Women who were sexually assaulted by a former restaurant owner had their day in court. Good evening and thank you for joining us. I'm Carla Chiquetto. And I'm Barbara Lee Edwards. Daniel Dorado was sentenced to prison today, but not before he heard from three of his accusers. News 8's Evan Narani has more on today's sentencing from downtown. Good evening. Earlier today, Daniel Dorado, the La Jolla restaurant owner who was convicted of sexually assaulting four women, heard his fate in a San Diego courtroom. He also heard from his victims. He was sentenced to 40 years in prison in total for those 20 counts that he was charged with. He also heard from the women themselves. He is an evil individual. He has shown history of repeatedly assaulting women through the use of daybreak drugs. He is a repeated offender who needs to be incarcerated so he can never commit this crime ever again. Dorado was found guilty on 20 felony counts involving four women. However, other women have come forward since saying they experienced similar situations with Dorado. He owned an Italian restaurant in the Bird Rock neighborhood of La Jolla and even used the restaurant to lure victims, claiming he wanted them to come for a job interview before spiking their drinks and raping them. Dorado was taken into custody in 2018 and found guilty in December of 2019. Today, he was back in court hearing from the women he assaulted as they gave their victim statements. We also heard heard that sentencing of 40 years in total. Now, Dorado first denied the claims, but now says he never spiked the women's drinks and that the sexual encounters were consensual. His restaurant has been closed since his arrest in 2018. And the women who spoke today say the reason why they chose to come forward and speak was because they wanted to send the message to any men who have done similar things that they will not get away with it, that they'll spend time in prison. They also noted they don't think they did anything wrong in this situation, but have now been left with years of trauma and PTSD. But they wanted their voices heard and they wanted to send that message. I'm Evan Irani, News 8. All right, thanks, Evan. It's been 18 years since her son disappeared, and she's still searching for answers. Tonight, Tamika Jones, the mother of two-year-old Jahi Turner, talks to News 8 about her son's disappearance, the trial against her ex-husband, Tyree Jones, and whether she has any hope that Jahi is still alive. News 8's Kelly Hesedal has the story. Well, Jahi Turner would have celebrated his 20th birthday this year. His mom's voice still shakes when she talks about the day he went missing 18 years ago. It was one of the most stressful uh, and heart-wrenching things I had to go through in my life. I, I couldn't believe it. Um, I didn't want to believe it. But Tamika Jones says she thought back then her son Jahi would still come home. Never expected uh, to, to not hold him again. Tamika was only 18 when Jahi went missing. His body has never been found. Now 37, she says it's clear her ex-husband, Tyree Jones' story, that her son just disappeared from a park in Golden Hill, didn't add up. Had you ever seen him hurt Jahi or hit him or be abusive toward him? No. What was it that caused you to change your mind about his story? It was everything that the police had, uh, all of the evidence that the police had shown me. And that evidence included a journal by her ex. It was part of the murder trial against him in 2018. In one entry, Jones wrote about a day in April where Jahi wasn't moving or really talking and that he was acting funny and wouldn't get off the floor. Tamika testified against Jones, but the case ended with a hung jury. The judge later announced there would be no retrial. And like hitting a brick wall every time is even harder. I broke down. My son's body wasn't, has never been found. You know, um, I knew it was going to be hard, but it was still harder for me to not understand how people can't see all of these pieces that led up to this, all of these lies. She says she hasn't talked to Jones in years. Do you have any hope at all that Jahi could be found alive? I would be lying if I said that I didn't. I want my son to walk through the door one day. Everything that I've done in my life is to prepare for him to, to come home. And it was really hard to, to wrap my around, uh, mind around the fact that maybe he would never come home. Even now, my 37, seven year old self, I have no idea what I'm supposed to do, but I know that I need to, to, to be out here. I need to be a voice. I need people to, to see me, understand my pain, understand my story. And if you would like to watch more of Tamika's interview, we've posted the full interview at CBS8.com. Barbara Lee and Carlo.
Tonight, officials are reporting 718 new coronavirus cases and 123 new hospitalizations. Seven new deaths were also reported today for a countywide total of 933. San Diego's case rate is now at 10.7, the county's two-week average, 4.4. More than 15,000 people were tested yesterday. More than 63,000 people have contracted the virus countywide so far. In the meantime, today, the County Board of Supervisors approved $2 million in income assistance for those impacted by the virus. Today, some San Diegans took the first step toward being part of the development of a COVID vaccine. The group is taking part in AstraZeneca's vaccine trial in Chula Vista. Some of the participants joined the trial today, while others showed up for follow-up visits. AstraZeneca's Phase 3 national study includes about 30,000 participants across the country. Researchers are still looking for more. You can sign up at COVIDVaccineSD.com. With all of Southern California now in the purple tier, some critics are questioning whether new restrictions will curb infections. They argue less than 20% of cases are tied to the business sectors affected by the move to the purple tier. News 8's Brandon Lewis goes beyond the numbers to explain why the health department now supports the restrictions. Now, Carlo and Barbara Lee, that 20% figure that was cited often today is based on October data. And it's something that was submitted to the state in the county's adjudication report to try to keep us out of the purple tier. Ultimately, the state ended up rejecting that argument. And that's how we got to the purple tier today. The county now says today it supports the move. The bottom line is the daily average of cases is rising at an astonishing rate. And it is important that we all collectively act quickly to change behavior. County supervisors got an update on the growing number of coronavirus cases in San Diego. The county was placed in the purple tier last week amid a rising case count, a move that either limited indoor capacity or pushed businesses completely outdoors. All age groups and sectors are now seeing an increase in cases with no single driver responsible for the surge in our cases. Part of the confusion goes back to last month when County Health reported most cases weren't happening in sectors that would be affected by a move into purple. But in the first two weeks of this month, their share has grown to nearly 23 percent combined. And now the agency supports the restrictions among rising cases. What has changed is the increasing number in cases and across the sectors, those numbers have also increased. The county is expected to release updated outbreak data. Statewide, many cases are coming from home gatherings and workplaces which are already restricted. Compliance officers have issued cease and desist orders to egregious violators on a complaint-driven basis, setting notices to 29 places Monday alone. That's more than half the total issued since March. Calls to the county's hotline last week are almost double the usual average. While our goal is voluntary compliance, including education and engagement, escalated enforcement has also been part of the process. Yesterday, the state temporarily suspended counties moving from a higher tier to a lower tier. So that means we're not likely to move toward red till the end of December. Carlo and Barbara Lee. All right, Brandon, thank you. A woman who lost her husband to COVID-19 is speaking out about her devastating loss. But as News 8's Chris Grove reports, she's also hoping what she and her family have gone through will serve as a warning to others. And Barbara Lee Carlo, look, I've been saying this all day, but it really is true. It is heartbreaking to listen to Irma Dohakas' story about losing her husband, Carlos. But it is necessary to listen to it because she has a warning for everyone. He was very proud of his family. He uh, treasured every moment. Any one of us would be lucky to have the type of love that Irma and Carlos Tojacas shared for decades. They met his children back in Tecate, Mexico. Irma noticed him right away. He was always joking. You know, he was very playful. He had a lot of friends. The two would go on to be married for 48 years. They had two daughters together and then eventually four grandchildren. He affectionately referred to his family as Los Diaz or the 10. There were family vacations, parties and talks of Carlos finally retiring after his 71st birthday. But that all changed when both Carlos and Irma got sick. Suddenly from one day to another, my body started aching and all that. While Irma eventually recovered, Carlos's condition only got worse. 
Eventually, a trip to the urgent care confirmed he had COVID-19. Complicating the matters, he was diabetic and had heart arrhythmia. He was quickly taken to the hospital after testing positive. He was intubated and put in an induced coma. Irma was blindsided. And the doctor told me, you have 10 minutes to say goodbyes. I go, what? Yes, he says, you have 10 minutes to say goodbye. Now, data shows that pre-existing conditions like Carlos's very often lead to severe cases of COVID-19. Certainly having those chronic conditions um, like hypertension, diabetes, being of older age does put you at risk of that. Dr. Abby Oluwade is with Sharp Reese Steely Family Medicine. She didn't treat Carlos, but she's worked with News 8 during this pandemic to better understand COVID-19 and its impact. But in some cases, it can happen very rapidly. Carlos was treated at Sharp Memorial Hospital. Irma, due to pandemic protocols, wasn't allowed to see him in person. She called every day, and sometimes a nurse would put the phone to Carlos's yeah. ear for Irma to encourage him. But Carlos could never talk back. Eventually, his condition worsened, and Irma, with one of her daughters, was allowed to visit him one last time. We said our goodbyes. He looked so good. I couldn't believe he was sick. After seeing Carlos, Irma and her daughter went to the hospital chapel, but not before she got the call. The nurse called me and says, you know, Irma, he passed. So I went into the chapel. I had just seen him and he looked like I could just pick him up and take him home. Six months later after Carlos's death, Irma is taking each day as they come. Some days are harder than most. And I'm trying to learn to live without him and to remember him, all the good times that we had. After hearing Irma tell the story of how COVID-19 impacted her family, you want to just give her a hug, comfort her. But of course, these days you can't. So instead, listen to her warning. Let's take care of ourselves right now. Let's follow the instructions. And if you don't care for yourself, care for other people. Irma says that Carlos's legacy and memory will live on in her family and the people he touched every day. How should I put it? It would make me feel so good, you know, to know that, that a lot of people really liked him and loved him. And look, in our long conversation with Irma, the one thing that really stood out was the fact that she felt Carlos still at 71 had so much life to live, but it was all cut short due to COVID-19, which is an important reminder for everyone that they still need to do their part. Reporting for News 8, I'm Chris Grow. Thank you, Chris. So many important messages in Irma's story, and it was incredibly brave of her to be able to come forward and share that. With, so I hope so many people were receptive to that. Yeah, and as we struggle with different restrictions as cases rise, understand there's a cost when we don't follow those. Absolutely, absolutely. So Irma, if you're watching, thank you for sharing your story. Yeah. We know it wasn't easy.